In our lesson today from Scripture, we're going to talk about how better it's better together. Everything in life is better together. I mean, church is better because we're all together, right? I mean, church would not have been uh, as exciting today if I were the only one here or you were the only one here. The fact that we're doing church together, uh, it makes it exciting. Life is better when we are doing it together. It, worship is better together. A, a movie is better when you are together with friends. A, a meal is better when you're together with loved ones. A vacation is better when the whole family is together. Well, on second thought, three out of four is not bad. Uh, I had, a, uh, I had a, one of the women in our church came up to me a, a few months ago, and she said, Pastor Carl, I just feel so inspired, you know, um, coming here, and she said, I have a goal. I have a goal. By Mother's Day, I'm going to drop 20 pounds. I'm like, awesome, cool. And I said, God will help you. Well, you know, Mother's Day came and went, and she came up to me uh, last, last night. She comes to Saturday night service with her family, and she said, 30 pounds. I'm like, awesome, way to go, high five. <laughs> I'm like, how'd you do it? And she said, Weight Watchers. And I'm like, totally cool. You know what? Sometimes trying to tackle something on your own it's going to be a, a tall order, right? But if you can do it together, say that with me, together. If you can do it with others, it becomes achievable. Well, I shared this in the classic service, and uh, one of the ladies in the classic service came up and said, Pastor Carl, I want you to know that I lost 130 pounds through Weight Watchers. And I'm like, hey, let's give it up for Weight Watchers today. Hey, thanks for the good work you're doing. Amen. The key is everything's better when we're doing it with someone else. When we are together. Amos 3.3, 3, uh, the prophet Amos said, How can two walk together unless they are in agreement? The power of togetherness. There's power in togetherness. I was preparing this message, you know, last week and uh, last few days I was looking for a title, looking for a subtitle, you know, what's a good subtitle? So I'm trying to say, Lord, you know, what's the main theme? What's the main thought? And I just, togetherness, the, the word together just kept coming out at me. And uh, lo and behold, not coincidentally, my wife uh, and another senior pastor's wife here in town, her and a friend, they drove out to Dallas to be a part of a conference, coincidentally, at a church called Trinity Church in Cedar Hill. Uh, coincidentally, uh, the pastor of Cedar, Cedar Hill, uh, of that Trinity Church, is the brother-in-law of Randall Ross, who used to be a pastor here at Trinity. And guess what the name of the women's conference was together. <laughs> together. Now look at the word together, guys. Single guys, there is a prophetic message in this, in this word, together. I want you to look at it closely. Look at it. Break it up. To get her. <laughs> if you want to be together with someone, you got to get her. Okay? And the Bible says, he that finds a wife finds a good thing. Uh, there was a man uh, that was at sea, and he couldn't swim, and he fell out of the ship. And so the captain wanted to rescue him. So the captain reached down and grabbed him by the arm to pull him back in the boat. And unbeknownst to the captain, the man was wearing a prosthetic, had a prosthetic arm. So when he pulled, the arm came off. Well, the next thing he could grab was he grabbed the man's hair. And lo and behold, the guy was wearing a toupee. And that came off. And so the captain said, he said, man, if you don't keep it together, I can't help you. Okay. Okay, if you want better jokes, you know you got to give more in the offering. Come on. <laughs> Everything's better together. Acts 4 is about their togetherness. We talked about this last week. We talked about the transcendence of their prayer. We talked about the truth of their prayer. We talked about the TNT or the power of the prayer. We're going to look at the togetherness of their prayer. Remember what happened in Acts 3? A great miracle, a man lame from his mother's womb was miraculously healed. Peter and John, Acts 4, they preach about this miracle that Jesus is alive and it was so remarkable and so powerful. 5,000 people, not including women and children, 5,000 men were saved and added to the church. Uh, the religious mafia of that day, they were not too altogether happy with that, so they arrested Peter and John. Uh, on the next day, they went to trial. They threatened them. They intimidated them. The day they were released from jail, they went back to their own company. They went back to church, and they celebrated that they were really worthy of being persecuted for Jesus' sake, and they prayed this absolutely incredible, powerful prayer. Through that came uh, the togetherness of that prayer, the togetherness of that prayer. And really, prayer produces intimacy. If you want to be close 
to God, you need to pray. And prayer produces intimacy. In a marriage, if a husband and a wife want to be close together, they have to pray for each other. They need to be intentionally praying for one another. Not necessarily always praying together, that's good, but praying for your spouse because prayer produces intimacy. And so they were together in their praying, and out of that togetherness came great power and great grace. Let's look at this uh, text in uh, Acts 4, beginning in verse 32. Uh, I do want to welcome all those that are watching live video streaming. We're glad that you are a part of this service. It's better together, but we're glad that you're with us live the internet. And uh, so if you're away or you're a shut-in, there's a great opportunity to still be a part of what God is doing here at Trinity. Verse 32, it says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Stop there. The multitude of those who believed. How many know a multitude is a big crowd? We don't know exactly how many, but it was a lot. But here's what we do know. On the day of Pentecost, there were 120 in the upper room, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter, from that moment, preached a powerful message in 3,000 souls. The Bible tells us 3,000 souls were added. So now there's 3,120 Christians, right? A few weeks later, the miracle happens with the the man at the gate called Beautiful and 5,000 men, not including women and children. So if you include the women and children, it could be estimated 15,000. So we're we're close to anywhere from between 15 and 20,000. This is what they would call a mega church. There was a multitude of those who believed And they were of one heart and one soul. Neither did any one say that any of the things he possessed was his own. But they laid all things, they had all things in common. Verse 33. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace came upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed, the apostles distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, or Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's pray. God, thank you for the privilege that we have to be here, to be in your presence with your people, studying Scripture, Lord. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, personalizing this message with pinpoint accuracy into every heart and life. May we hear exactly what you want us to hear today, God. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. I love Psalm 133, verse 1. It says this, "How, how great, how wonderful it is for God's brothers to live together in harmony. How pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Uh, There's a blessing that's attached to togetherness. There's a blessing that is attached when the church is united and not divided. This word together that's used here in Acts is actually used 11 times in the New Testament. It is a particular Greek word. I gave the transliteration of that word, I believe, in the notes that are available if you'd like to uh, access them through through your app or on the Internet. Um, And here's what this word together from the Greek New Testament, what it actually means. It denotes an inner unity, an inner unity of a group of people engaged in an external similar action. What does it mean to be together as the people of God? It means that, that we are united as a group of individuals because we're all engaged in the same similar outward activity. And that is making Jesus known to a lost world in desperate need of Christ. Now, this word together, as I mentioned, is used 11 times in the New Testament. Get this. It's used 10 times in the book of Acts, which is telling us something, how important this togetherness. That's how the church started. They started together. They stayed together. They worked together. They worshiped together. They prayed together. And anything that comes together in the name of Christ, you know the enemy is going to want to come to try to bring division. So it says in Acts 1.14, they were together in prayer. In Acts 2, they were together in one place. In Acts 2.46, they were together daily in worship and the Lord's Supper. In Acts 8, they were together in obedience. In Acts 15, verse 25, they were together in a business meeting. Now, that may not sound very spiritual, but how many know that churches and, and all organizations need to have important strategic, tactical 
times of coming together, meetings, and God can be in that meeting. Uh, here at Trinity, the elders, the board of elders, we meet once a month. Uh, we have weekly meetings with our pastors, and a meeting can be spiritual because we're together and we're united for a common outward or external similar activity. So the key is togetherness. Now, why is togetherness important? Because there is strength in numbers. Uh, the Bible says one can put 1,000 to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight. So there's a multiplication of, of power, of talent, skill, and ability. Uh, one plus one equals three. There is synergy in the kingdom of God, and so there's power in numbers. I was thinking about that, and then I thought of, I thought of ants. See, the Bible says in Proverbs 6.6, 6, look at what the Bible says. Uh, I mean, no, the Bible's not politically correct. And uh, the Bible can say some harsh things sometimes, especially the book of Proverbs. It doesn't pull any punches. So let's read this out loud, Proverbs 6.6. 6. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. So God is saying, if you want wisdom, one way to acquire wisdom is to take a closer, word, a closer look at his creation. In particular, take a closer look at ants. Now, if you think about an ant, an ant by itself is not impressive. A little single ant by itself is not impressive. But a colony of ants is very impressive and quite amazing. I remember as a little kid, I didn't know ants were bad for you, right? And I remember, I mean, I was like really small, but it marred me to this day, right? I sat and I played on an anthill. Have you ever done that? I hope you've ever done something as stupid as that, right? But I, I got stung. I got bit like everywhere. I went into the house crying, right, because I had all these bio... Ants can be powerful together. That's the point of the story. How do we know that we can be powerful, say it with me, together, together? So I thought I would look up some incredible facts about ants. I'm going to give you some ant facts. So ant fact number one. You know the total weight of all the ants in the world is as much, if not more, than the total weight of all the humans in the world today. That's an interesting fact. Fact number two, some ants can support up to 100 times their weight while on glass upside down. You don't want to mess with an ant, right? Uh, here's ant fact number three. You know the largest colony ever discovered was over 3,750 miles wide? One single ant colony. So as I was doing my research, you know, I came across this awesome video, and it showed these archaeologists that found this vacant, abandoned ant colony. And so they poured tons, literally tons of concrete into this abandoned ant colony. And, and here's the picture of what they discovered as they excavated it, right? They found the most incredible and amazing subterranean structure that was the home of eight million ants. This subterranean structure had 1,920 chambers, which required the ants to transport 40 tons of soil to the surface of the earth, little by little. A single ant is not very impressive, but a colony of ants is quite impressive. Did you know they are the longest living of all insects, living up to 30 years? Ants and humans are the only creatures that farm other creatures. There are ants in Indonesia, and they transport mealybugs, they put them in their mouth, and they, transplant, they transport them to plants to help them harvest the sweet juices from those plants. I mean, you got to give it to the ants, right? They know, they know. They know some important things about staying alive, about survival. And then here's an interesting one, uh, the, the sixth ant fact that I wanted to share with you is that there are three types of ants, workers, soldiers, and then the queen ant. What I didn't know, I knew that, but what I didn't know is all ants are female. All the workers, all the soldiers, and of course the queen, they're all female ants, which I've always believed. If you want to get a job done, hire a woman. Here's why. Here's why. So I said, well, where are the guys? Because I mean, you can't have baby ants without a mama ant and a papa ant. Uh, I, I mean, you know, uh, creation itself speaks of wisdom. Hello? So I found out that there are male ants. They're called drones. 
and they don't work. I thought, that's kind of cool, you know, just get all the ladies doing everything, right? That's the way it is in most houses. But anyway, <laughs> you know what? They have one job. You know what their job is? To fertilize the queen ant when it's that time of the year. <laughs> Little biology here. So they, until they find a queen ant that needs to get married, needs to have some baby ants. So the guy, <laughs> you know this, he, he goes, he does his thing, and then what? Guess what happens? He dies. <laughs> Ladies, don't get any ideas, okay? That's all I'm saying. He's done. And the way my mind works, I thought, there's got to be that one guy in that says, I'm not doing it. <laughs> Life is more important. And maybe he's flying somewhere right now, far away from that queen ant as he possibly can. Because he knows to get her together, he's toast. He's, he's done. Stay alive, little ant, wherever you are. <laughs> so what's the, what's the metaphor for the church? That uh, we're better together, right? There's strength in numbers. And so the early church experienced this thing called unity. How, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, for it's there that God commands the blessing, Psalm 133, 1 and 2 tells us. So they were together in unity. Look at verse 32 again. It says, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. What's powerful about this? Listen, what's powerful about this? They were of one heart and of one soul. This was a diverse church. In Acts chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, the 3,000 that were added to the church on the day of Pentecost... They made up, this is the diversity, the demographic diversity of all those that had become Christians. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Grecians and Arabs. This was the diverse gathering of people literally from all over the known world, and they all became united, and they all became of one heart and of one soul, even though they had different upbringings and different traditions and different backgrounds, they became one at the foot of the cross. Aren't you excited about the, the unifying power of the cross in the life, in your life, in my life, the life of an individual? That we all come from different walks and different backgrounds, and different nationalities, and different genders, males, and women, and, and young, and old, and, and those that are on one end of the economic scale, and those that may be on the other end of the economic scale. But how many of you know there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek? We're all one. We're all united in Christ at the foot of the cross. The, the, at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. And we're to be of one heart, and we're to be of one soul, or we're to be of one mind. Why is this important? Because the most incredible prayer ever prayed was prayed by Jesus and recorded by John in John's Gospel, chapter 17. And in that prayer, Jesus specifically prayed in verse 21 that, that we would be one, even as he and the Father are one. That we would be in unity, church. That as a church here called Trinity, that we would be of one heart and of one soul, that we would be united. As St. Augustine said, in the essentials, we must have unity. We must have unity around the person of Jesus Christ. The only way we can be in fellowship together is if we all believe that he was born of a virgin, he was God in human form, he, was, he, he laid down his life on the cross, was buried on the third day, was gloriously raised from the dead, that there's power in his blood for the forgiveness of sins, that he is Lord, and that he is soon to return. Those are the essentials of our faith, and we must all have unity around the essentials of our faith, and there are other essentials of our faith. But So in the essentials, we have unity, but in the non-essentials, we're to have liberty. But in all things, we're to show charity. What are some of the non-essentials? Maybe you like it loud. Maybe you like it, you know, not so loud. Maybe you like it, you know, one way, or in worship and, and ministry and, and the preaching styles. And, and there are, are many things that are really non-essentials. And we're to show grace and liberty to one another. Amen? Amen? But in all things, we're to have charity. We're to love one another. 
You see, I can be in unity with Chris Galanis, not because we're under the same roof worshiping, but we're under the same banner worshiping, and it's not the banner of e-life or Trinity. It's not the banner of Catholicism or Protestantism. It's the banner of the risen Savior of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we can all be united. I'm not referencing that e-life's a Catholic church, but you know what I'm talking about. I mean, all of Christendom, the, the Catholic branch or the, the Protestant branch of, of Christendom, if people believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior and they've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you're my brother. You're my sister. I feel like singing it right now, but I won't. You're my brother. Anyway, okay. Look to the person and say, you're my brother or you're my sister, if, you know, depending on what they are. You are something. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Unity. We can have unity without uniformity. You know what that means? We don't all have to look alike, talk alike, and dress alike. Aren't you glad that we all look differently? We all speak differently? We all think differently. How many know God wants us to celebrate our differences, not, you know, obsess over our differences? We all look different, talk different, dress different. If we all look the same, talk the same, think the same, dress the same, guess what we would have? A cult. <laughs> and stay as far away from those cults as you possibly can. Amen. You know what made America great and why we're not so great right now? because we've always been referred to as the United States of America. One nation under God. And as we cease being one nation under God, we are one nation gone under, okay? Because a house divided cannot stand. So they were together in unity. Uh, the next thing is they were together in grace and power. You see, out of that unity comes power. And grace. Look at what it says in verse 33. And with great power, say that with me, great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That was the central theme of their preaching, which needs to be the central theme of our preaching. He's alive. He's alive. Aren't you glad? You come to a church that reminds you not of a dead Savior, but of a living Savior. He's not dead. He's alive, right? So the fact he's alive has to show up in our preaching, has to show up in our worship, right? Has to show up in our serving, right? Has to show up in our giving, has to show up in every aspect of our lives because Jesus is alive. And that changes everything. And then it says, and they had great grace. Say that with me, great grace. Great power, great grace was upon them all. Now. The word great that's used here is where we get our word mega, megatons, where we get our word dynamite. So they were a mega church, not just because of the physical size, the numerical size. They were a mega, because the word great means mega. They were a great church because they had great power. They had great grace. Why? Because they were of one heart and they were of one soul. And that produced great power and great grace. But they were also together in generosity. Look at what it says in verse 34 and 35. Nor was there any one among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. And the apostles distributed to each as anyone had need. This is a special moment in the early church. This is a special occasion. At first blush, when you read that, you think, whoa, wait a minute. Are they advocating socialism here? Are they advocating communism here? I mean, what's actually going on here? Well, first of all, what you need to know is this. Extraordinary times require extraordinary measures. This was an extraordinary time. Of all the people that were Christians at this time, maybe close to 20,000, give or take, 
all of them, listen very carefully, all of them, though they were from different parts of the world, all of them were former Jews who had now become Christians. Now, why is that important? You see, initially, the early church believed that if you were going to, be, if you were going to get saved, be born again, become a Christian, you had to, if you were a Gentile, you had to first become a Jew, and then you could become a Christian. Everyone that was saved at this time, because salvation doesn't go to the Gentiles until Acts chapter 10. Everyone that's saved at this time, they were all Jews or converted to Judaism. As a result of that, they were being discriminated against. As a result of that, they were losing their ability to make a living. As a result of that, they were being pushed out of society, particularly in Jerusalem, the most religious city of the world, right? The center of Judaism. And they were no longer being accepted. They were being ostracized. And so they formed a new gathering. They were part of a new family, the family of God. And how many know that when we act and live as family, when a family member begins to hurt and has a legitimate need, how many know that the family rallies around that individual and provides the help that that family member needs? That's what the early church was doing. This is a is a declarative uh, story in Acts, not a normative story, which means it declares what happened, but it doesn't normalize it. There is no other place in the book of Acts where this is ever practiced again, which is significant. It's never mentioned again. It's never, ever endorsed by the apostles, by those who wrote the, the rest of the New Testament that was going to later to be written, the epistles. Paul Peter, John, James, in their letters, they never refer to this moment, and they never make it a normal practice for churches to follow. Why? Because, my friend, every Jew understood God's system of economics. Jews, to this day, are blessed and flourish. Only like 3% of the world population, and they, they have such a a large amount of the, the, the wealth and resources of this world. And it goes back to the very beginning. They understand the teaching of God, the teachings of God related to money and to economics from the Torah. And what they understood was God believes in a free market economy. God believes in economic freedom. So in the Old Testament, God mandated, God made it a commandment that you had a right to personal ownership. You had a right to personal property. You had a right to own your possessions without fear of someone by fraud or fear or coercion or intimidation to take what is rightfully yours. And God even put it in the Ten Commandments. Commandment number seven, God said, thou shalt not steal. What does that mean? That means I do not have a right to take from you something that belongs to you because you have the right to ownership. I have no right to, by fraud or by coercion, to take what is rightfully yours and make it mine. That, my friend, is stealing. So God is against that. God, in the Old Testament, hated a false balance or a false weight. On numerous occasions, if you read through the Old Testament, God reiterates how he hates a false balance. Why does God hate a false balance? Because God wants economic freedom. He wants, he wants fair market value for whatever you offer to another and to not be cheated in a contractual business exchange. So, if I'm going to buy from Brad a pound of hamburger meat because he's a butcher, and I'm going to give him something of value, Either it's a barter system or it's actual money. I'm going to buy a pound of hamburger meat. Under God, he's required to sell me exactly a pound and not to have a false weight so that when he puts the, the, the meat on the scale, it seems like it's a pound, but it's not because he's using a false weight. God detests that because that is greed. And now, so God requires there to be an, an equal exchange for a service that's been rendered. And God gives humans the right to engage in a free economy. 
that if I have something of value and you have something of value, and if we want to exchange what I have of value for what you have of value because what I have you need and what you need I have, that's, that's a free market economy. We should be able to do that without, without a third party interference. And if we want to say, hey, let's, you got something I have, I've got something you have, let's, let's, let's start something together. And then on a larger scale, we could take our services and provide them for these individuals over here, and we can begin to franchise what we have. That type of mentality is what grew and made America the most powerful economic powerhouse that the world has ever seen because it was driven by a free market economy concept. Now listen, listen. In the Old Testament, God said in Deuteronomy 8.18, he says, I give you the power, I give you the ability to create wealth. God says, I, he gave his people, the Jews, his chosen people, I have given you the ability to create wealth. He didn't say, I give you wealth. No, I give you the ability to create wealth. Big difference. See, God gives the ability to create wealth, not so that others can confiscate that wealth and then redistribute that wealth against your wishes and against your will. Listen to me very carefully. In the life of Jesus, you will never find in the Gospels, and if he did it, it would have been recorded because it would have been significant. You never find in the Gospels where Jesus gave another person money. He never gave another human being money. He gave them love. He gave them grace. He gave them hope. He gave them encouragement. He gave them food. He gave them bread. He multiplied their fish. He even gave them wine at a wedding reception. But he never reached in his pocket, gave someone money. Why? Give someone a fish to eat for a day. Teach someone to fish, and they eat for a lifetime. God gives you the ability. He gives you the power. He gives you the right to go out there with the skills, talents, and abilities he's given you and to help build wealth and to increase the value not only of your life but the life of everyone else that is around you. That's the concept of God's system of economics and God blesses it. God blesses it. God uh, came up to a man one time, a long time ago, thousands of years ago. He was from Ur of the Chaldees. His name was Abram. His father, Terah, was an idol maker, a maker of false gods. Purely by the grace of God and the foreknowledge and predetermined, predestined plan of God, he called this man Abram, and he said, Abram. He said, Abe. One day he said, Abe. And Abram's like, yeah? Is that Siri? Where'd that voice come from? <laughs> Look up here. Okay, I'm God. You got my attention. Abe, I want you to come into a covenant relationship with me. What? Me? You sure you got the right one? Yeah, you. He said, now, Abe, I want you to look down at the ground. You see all of the grains of sand? Yeah. That's what your descendants are going to look like one day. Then I guess God talked for a long time because it got dark. So now, look up. You see all the stars? He's like, yeah. Can you count those stars? No. I can't even begin to. He said, your descendants are going to be like the sand and the stars. And he says, here's what I'm going to do, Abe. I'm going to change your name to Abraham. I'm going to put my name in your name because we're going to be in covenant now. What you have is mine. What I have is yours. And how many know when you go into covenant relationship with God, he gets the short end of the stick. <laughs> I mean, we don't have much to offer God, right? But he has everything. He said, now we're going to be in covenant. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do, Abe. I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to bless you so that you will be a blessing to all the nations of the world and to all the families of the world. And how many of you know the world today is blessed because of one man who said yes to the promises of God. One man who received God's blessing so that he in return could what? Be a blessing to others. You know God wants you to be blessed and he wants to bless you because he wants you 
to be a blessing to others. So God gives you the power to create wealth. Did you know that Western civilization was built on the, what they call the Protestant work ethic? What's the Protestant work ethic? It's everything I said, everything that's written in the Torah about God's economic system, but it's crystallized in two verses that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse 10 and 11. Don't you remember the rule that we had when we lived with you? If you don't work, you don't eat. That was one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I quoted that to my sons from the time they were little. You don't work, you don't eat in this house. You have to work. If you, you like food, I like food. Then you got to work. You got to work hard. Six days thou shalt work. That's what the Word of God says. God believes in hard work. The first thing God gave Adam before God gave him a, to get her together, a wife, he gave Adam a job. How many know that all work, all work has value? As long as it's not illegal, immoral, illicit. But all work <laughs> has value. And there's value. There's nothing that will make you feel better about yourself than a good day of hard work. And everyone works, whether you're a homemaker, a, a house, a, well, that's, that's an old term. <laughs> I might even sound offensive. I might get some letters on that or emails on that. Whether you're a stay-at-home mom or you're the president of a CEO, everyone has work, and work has value, and God honors work, and God rewards work. You might lose a job, but you're never out of work because as long as there's a need somewhere that someone has you have something that God's blessed you with to give to them and to help create value and to help create wealth and to make the world a better place some people say well I'm out of a job but I don't want to go flip burgers if the only job available for you or me someday is to go and I've, I've done that before by the way is to flip burgers then be the best burger flipper that restaurant has ever seen because we do our work as unto the Lord and not unto man. Come on, don't preach me down because I'm shouting real, because I'm preaching real good. Listen, if you'll become the best burger flipper that restaurant's ever had, you won't stay as a burger flipper for long. You will become a manager and then a district manager and then you will eventually own your own burger shop. Hallelujah to God. Because he's called you to be the head and not the tail above only and not beneath. Bless going and bless coming. I'm preaching now. I'm having fun. I'm not going to quit. <laughs> All right, let me wrap it up. Listen, modern socialism says what's yours is mine. Early Christians said What's mine is yours. Not socialism, not communism, generosityism. And I just made that word up. Now let me give you, let me, let me just give you some good old cow sense, horse sense here. Okay, we're from West Texas. This is the two cows under isms. Two cows under isms. This, this will crystallize everything I've been trying to say. Socialism. If you have two cows, the government seizes one and gives, you, uh, gives one to your neighbor. That's socialism. Marx, Marxist communism, if you have two cows, you give them to the government, and the government gives you some milk. Fascism, if you have two cows, you keep the cows and give the milk to the government, and then the government sells you some of that milk. New Dealism, if you have two cows, you shoot one, milk the other, and then pour the milk down the drain. Totalitarianism, you have two cows, the government shoots you and takes your two cows from you. <laughs> Capitalism. If you have two cows, you sell one and buy a bull. Oh, come on, church. If you have two cows, you sell one, go find yourself a bull. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. I hear that little male ant flying. Stay, stay, stay far away, little ant. <laughs> stay far away. <laughs> All right, and then finally, they were together in encouragement. Here's what happened. Here's the great example of a great man, Joseph, who's also named Barnabas. You see, the early church had a tradition when you got saved and then baptized in water, at, there were times they would change your name. Now, he had a good name to begin with. Joseph is a very biblical name, but they gave him the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Names have meaning, and names are significant, and names are important in the Bible. Who was Barnabas? Well, it says he was a Levite. Uh, the country of Cyprus, which was a metropolitan uh, community, which means he was very broad in his, he was very cultured and, and, and broad in his perspective. He wasn't born, bred, and raised just in Jerusalem. 
Nothing wrong with that, but it would give you a very narrow view of the world. But he was a Levite. And Levites didn't own land. And yet there's an exception here in, in this man's life. And he had land. See, you can't sell something you don't have. So it's right back to the right of ownership. He, he had land. And voluntarily, not because the government mandated it, not because the apostles mandated it, voluntarily from his own generous heart because he saw the need and he wanted to respond to the need as God has prospered and blessed him. He sold land. He sold his, what, what he owned, which means he was a real estate agent. He's, you know, so you real estate people, you're good people. So he sold what he had, and then this seems very unspiritual. He brought that money to the church. He laid it at the apostles' feet. He said, now distribute it accordingly as God leads as you see fit. Wow. I mean, what a story. Now that sets up the stage for chapter 5 of Acts. Lord willing, next week. In chapter 5, there, were, there was a couple, Ananias and Sapphira. They saw the honor that was bestowed on Barnabas for this act that he did selflessly, not to be seen of men, but to honor God. They thought they would mimic it for the wrong reasons. And if you come back next week or if you go on and read ahead, you'll find out what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Wasn't a very good experience for them. I'd like every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we humbly come before you today and we just pray that we would all be a Barnabas in someone's life, that we would all speak words of life and peace and encouragement, that, Lord, we would be a Barnabas church, that we would bring encouragement in the lives of those who are discouraged. Through our ministries, we would be a Barnabas, bring encouragement, hope, support to those that need it. I pray, Lord, all of us have an opportunity to be a Barnabas to someone, to a spouse, to a child, to a friend, to a co-worker, and even to one another as fellow church members. So, Lord, take this message and, and filter it, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, and pinpoint exactly what we need to hear today. Heads bowed, eyes closed. What would the Lord have you do with this message today? What is he saying to you through it? Respond in faith. Please be obedient to what God's calling you to do. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you can know his love, grace, and forgiveness. Jesus died on the cross for everyone, and he loves you. And he's standing at the door of your heart knocking, and if you will hear his voice and open up the door of your heart and invite Christ to come into your heart, he'll come into your life, and he'll be your Lord and your Savior, and he'll have relationship, fellowship with you, and you can have fellowship with him. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, just pray this prayer out loud with the rest of us. Say it with your own mouth, but mean it. Mean it from your own heart. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father. I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we thank the Lord together, church family?